Hello there. My name is Matthew McInerney, and as of this video, I am a second year student in Centennial College's game development program. Now, in this video, we will be exploring a topic with no real conclusion. The purpose of this video is to not teach, but to spark an interest in these topics and inspire further research and discussion. I have often been infuriated when I listen to people try to explain their hallucinations or their dreams. It seems that they can never really describe the image that they see in their head, or even if when you consider somebody says that they have an out-of-body experience, such as I was looking at myself on the operating table, is a very common one. While this may paint a visual picture, it still does not convey what it's actually like to experience it. Likewise, when people say that they have sleep paralysis, when listening to accounts from those who suffer from sleep paralysis, they may be able to describe whatever figure is standing in the corner of the room, but it still doesn't tell us what it's like to actually believe that the hallucination is real. Everybody experiences things differently, which is why it's so difficult for us to understand others' personal experiences, even if we have similar ones. But that got me thinking, are those experiences and those hallucinations real? Well, the simple answer, and the easy answer is, well, no, they're not. But then, why do they seem so real? Well, that's because to the person who's experiencing them, technically, yes, they are real. So, the next question is, how can something be real to one person, but not another? Well, that's thanks to the subjective reality. A subjective reality refers to the individual's perception and observation of reality. Such observations are shaped by personal beliefs, experiences, biases, etc. And this subjective reality is what allows every single human being across all of history to continuously have completely different experiences than any of their peers. So if everybody experiences the world continuously, completely differently, then how is it possible that we can prove anything is real at all? Well, that's thanks to the objective reality. The objective reality is a reality that exists independent of individual observation and perception. It refers to a reality that cannot be observed simply because the nature of observation is what initializes a subjective reality. However, we do know that the objective reality exists, and this is thanks to scientific processes and empirical evidence. Now, if humanity creates technology in which we're able to artificially manufacture a reality, how would it fall within our definitions of objective and subjective reality? Essentially, would it even be real? Well, first let's consider traditional video games as we know it. Is the virtual world that we experience on our monitors real? Well, yes, it is. Subjectively, somebody is experiencing it. They're seeing it, they can hear it, certain controllers allow for haptic feedback, allowing them to feel it, and objectively, it exists when we can prove this mathematically. We can prove that it takes up a certain amount of storage on a hard drive. Now let's take it up a notch. Let's consider full immersion virtual reality. We can see that we can experience full immersion reality through many more channels compared to conventional video games. While conventional video games it's just sight, sound, and feel, with full immersion we can experience all the senses we experience in our physical world. Such senses could include sight, sound, taste, smell, feel, a sense of space, balance, proprioception, which is basically the sense that you know where your body parts are without actually having to see them. There are numerous pros to this kind of technology. Such a level of immersion could revolutionize the way we play, train, communicate, and it could allow those with disabilities an unimaginable level of accessibility. You could talk for hours and hours about all of the pros, but with a long list of pros, naturally there comes an equally long list of cons. Such cons being the dependence on technology, hyperbolized levels of addiction, spending excessive time with full immersion could easily lead to health concerns and isolation, and the list goes on and on. One thing we know for certain is that if such a technology were to be commercialized, it could very easily reach levels of Gutenberg's printing press. Whether full immersion will help or hurt society, that will be a debate that will never end. But now for an interesting question.
if we are able to create a virtual world that can be experienced subjectively through all the same means as the physical world and can be proven it objectively exists, what makes it fundamentally different than our own? The answer to that question is that the virtual world is dependent on human technology as opposed to the physical world which operates independently to human observation or manipulation. Essentially, the only difference is the method of creation. And while this new technology asks a lot of new philosophical questions and presents many new problems, it also sheds lights on many old problems, the biggest of which being the classic, how do we know that we're not in a simulation ourselves? Such an idea can even be traced back hundreds of years to French philosopher René Descartes who asked, how do you know you're not being fooled by an evil genius feeding you sensations into your mind? How the physical world that we know isn't actually an extremely advanced virtual reality. Well, it's impossible to know for certain whether or not we're in a simulation, but considering how many simulated realities are currently in our world, and how many, perhaps billions of realities there will likely be, it almost seems a bit naive to believe that our single reality is the only true one. Admittedly, it is quite pessimistic to consider our physical world the one that we all know and love as just not being real. However, the reason it seems pessimistic to consider this is because not real, or a simulation, implies a sense of trickery or deception, and it's because of these negative implications that many people find the idea of a virtual world to hold less value than our physical one. They simply see it as trickery, deception, as not being real. And that would include all of the emotions that one would feel towards this virtual world. The happiness, the pleasure, the sadness that they experience from it are just simple binary. I quite flatly disagree with such a stance, arguing that the virtual reality is a sort of second-class reality implies that the subject of reality of those who observe it holds less value than whose subject of reality is observing the physical world, which simply is not the case. And anyone who has made a friend from online or has shared a precious moment online would also disagree with this argument, but it even goes one step further. Anyone who has had any sort of experience in the virtual world that has produced a real feeling knows that such experiences were very much real. And despite our world's current virtual reality being extremely primitive in the terms of sensations that you can feel while observing it, how it's only sight, sound, and feel, we still develop visceral, real reactions. Now imagine full immersion virtual reality. Imagine the kinds of feelings, reactions we will have based on our experiences. Quite frankly, it's simply a delusion to call that not real. The revolutionized way we play and learn, create, communicate, and the fact that it will be indistinguishable from our physical world. Of course, there are going to be many hurdles and many difficulties that we must overcome as a society, but I truly believe that full immersion virtual reality will usher humanity to a new stage. As I said in the beginning, this video was meant to spark debate and inspire further individual research. These topics, they have no real answer and for the most part, it's a matter of perspective, literally and figuratively. This technology is coming, whether we're ready or not.